bit fatter than he was last week, too. <laughs> Since I'm a little bit uglier, I'm going to say he's a little bit fatter. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to, the sermon I have entitled for you guys tonight is, uh, Which Thief Are You? And uh, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 23, and we're going to read verses 33 through 43. <clears throat> And as we turn there, <clears throat> I ask all of you guys to please remember my wife in prayer um, and uh, her mom. We will be going down to Texas, not this coming week, but next week, to, so she can go see her mom and spend time with her in the hospital and have that time with her um, as she needs. Um, her uncle uh, ministered the gospel to her, um, and I'm going to have the chance to minister the gospel to her. So please pray that, the, that God uh, delivers his message clearly to her through me, uh, that ultimately she's saved. If any of you don't know, her mother has, uh, we found out not too long ago, her mother was found with cancer in her right lung, um, and uh, it's just gotten worse. It took over one lung, now it's taken over the other one. Um, and she's only 40-something too, I think, so I don't know her exact age, but... Um, you know, but at the end of the day, me and my wife came to the conclusion, you know, we know God could heal her, but uh, whatever his will be, what's most important, more than physical healing, is that she's saved before she goes, right. you know, because, uh, you know, you could, you can um, be in perfect health and die and go to hell, so, you know, it's important to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, so before you die and cross over, because once you cross over, that's it, that's it, there's no other, there's no chance for you. After that, your chance is here. So, the title again I said is, Which Thief Are You? Which Thief Are You? All right, Luke chapter 23, verses 33 through 43. Let's read. And then after we read those verses, we'll pray and then we'll get into it. <clears throat> All right. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, or derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Let's pray. Amen. Father God, we'll just come to you in prayer. Lord, I just want to thank you so much, Lord, for everything you do. Lord, thank you for giving us a good um, homecoming today, Lord. Father God, but what's most important, Lord, is not so much the activities here, Lord, and this or that, God, but you are the most important, Jesus. God, I ask you in this sermon, there will be one thing that's done, is that you be lifted high and you only, God. Lord, I ask you to hide me, Lord, Father. I ask you to forgive me, Lord, if any sin that would hold me back or be a hindrance for you using me, Jesus. I just ask that it only be you, God. Lord, I'm not here to glorify myself or, or get praise from anybody, God. I stand behind this pulpit in fear, in fear of you, Lord. All I want is you to be praised and all I want is you to be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, then the Bible tells us, if we look at Luke twenty two forty three, and there appeared, an, oh, I'm sorry, I went ahead of myself, forgive me. All right, before Jesus went to Calvary to be crucified, he knew of what was to come. He understood the cost it would take to be led as the perfect lamb to be slaughtered on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. He knew of the anguish and all he would have to endure. We know in the Garden of Gethsemane, just before uh, just before his arrest, Jesus prayed saying this in Luke twenty two forty two, saying, Father, if it be, <clears throat> if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but thy, but thine be done. Then the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 22, 43, it says, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. We see in the context of Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is God himself, manifested in the flesh, knew what was to come, who was willing to endure the cross. And we know that because according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says this, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ endured the cross? Amen. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ went and was will, willfully went to the cross and humbled himself to die for you on the cross of Calvary. I know I'm thankful today that Jesus Christ died for me on the cross. Because if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ, there would be no way I would get into heaven today. Amen. Folks, I'm not a good person, but God is good. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says there's only one that is good, and that is God. Amen. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Bible says the scriptures teach us that Jesus is God manifested in the flesh, walking around in a fleshly temple. But underneath that shell of a temple is the almighty God who walked among wicked men. The scriptures tells us that Jesus is the invisible image of God. We know this because Colossians chapter 1, <clears throat> 15 through 16 says this, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is the invisible God. He is the creator of the universe. He is the Savior. And He is coming back again. It doesn't matter what the atheist will say. It doesn't matter what the non-believer will say. The Bible says that in the beginning... God made the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, he created man and female. The Bible does not lie. It doesn't matter what the atheist said. He is God, and he has created all things. Amen. And one day, he's coming again. He will come again. Because that's one thing God cannot do. God cannot lie. He never will lie. Men lie. Everyone else can lie, but God will never lie to you. We know that in the Garden of Gethsemane, that strength is needed due to the suffering and pain his body would have to endure. And him knowing how bitter the cup of iniquity would taste, the sins of every man, the sins of the whole world, taking on our sins upon himself, as the Bible says, we know he did because it says in Isaiah 53, 6, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The iniquity of, all, of us all. And we know that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Hebrews 2.9 says, I don't care what the Calvinist says. I don't care what this person says. He tasted death for every man. He went to the cross for every man. And he's not a respecter of persons. and gives every man an opportunity to be saved if man goes to hell it's because he rejected the way, the truth, and the life. He is accountable for his own destination. God has made the way. God doesn't predestinate some people to go to hell and some people to go to heaven because he's not a respecter of persons, right? He doesn't say, oh, well, I choose Bob over him. No. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. And Christ died for all that all could be saved if they trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. So if you reject Jesus Christ, that's on you. That's not on God. God has made a way. He has sent everything. He sent His only begotten Son to die upon a cross for your sins. If you reject Jesus Christ, you will go to hell because of what you chose to do. Not because of what God, God didn't just send you there. The Bible says he doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't take pleasure of a soul that goes to hell. But you put yourself there. You make the decision. And you are casted in there because of your choice. <laughs> because of your choice. Jesus knowing he would be suffering the wrath of God that was meant for us. But Jesus humbled himself and became a willing, perfect sacrifice to die in our place. And rising from the grave, who is victorious over death, hell, and the grave, that we also 
be quickened and raised alive at the moment of salvation when we receive Christ through the gospel message by the power of the Holy Ghost. By the power of the Holy Ghost. The same way that Jesus was victorious over the grave and he rose from the dead is the same way when you put your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, trusting that he died and was buried and rose again, your soul was raised and regenerated and raised from the dead as well. And I said here, the Holy Ghost, and that one day this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So not only when we were saved, our soul was raised from the day, one day we're going to have a new body too that's going to be incorruptible. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians. Listen to what Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51 through 57. Listen to what he says. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall he then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who, uh, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. One day this body is going to be changed. One day I'm going to have a new body. I have victory in, the, in Jesus Christ. One day death is going to lose its sting. I will never have to face death again in my life because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He said, whosoever believeth in me shall have everlasting life. That's what the Bible says. I shall never die because I have believed on the Son of God. I've trusted in Him. Have you trusted in Him as your Savior? Have you trusted in Him? Now going back, we see when Jesus was in the garden again of Gethsemane in Luke twenty-two forty-four. And this is what it says. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Falling down to the ground. Now, I read this thing. I thought it was interesting. I want you to listen. This rare situation is called, I might say this wrong because I'm not a medical professional, but uh, I think it's called hematridosis. Okay? And it occurs when under extreme stress, the small... Uh, capillaries surrounding the sweat glands burst and blood mixed with sweat pours out of the sweat glands. He needed the strength to endure to what was come. You imagine he's sitting there and the stress that was upon Christ of what was come. He was going to have to drink that wine, drink, the, uh, drink down the wrath of God, having to drink down the iniquity of us all, knowing what was going to come, every step that was going to take for the crucifixion. And that was happening. Blood drops mixed with his sweat coming down. He asked, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. <clears throat> I believe in those moments our Lord was thinking two things. He was thinking the horror. And I said the horror. The horror of what was to come. All the pain he had to endure and the cup of iniquity and the wrath of God he must drink down. And then number two, I think he was thinking this. Second, I believe he was thinking about us. And what joy it shall be for all of those who will be saved because of the great sacrifice of the Son of God. He had you on his mind. I believe in that moment he had us on his mind. He saw the day that I would believe on his son. He saw the day that when he would be crucified, the joy it would be to know that all of them who would put their faith in him would become the sons of the living God. What a joy he saw it to be. But what a horror it would take for that joy to come. What a horror he had to go through first. Let's look at the sufferings and how they began. The beginning of his sufferings began right after he was betrayed with a kiss by Judas. And let me keep this. I want you to know this. Judas was never a believer. Right. Judas was nothing but a thief. Right. He stole from the Lord's ministry. Amen. He never believed on Christ. Right. He used the ministry. He wasn't saved. He wasn't saved. He never trusted in Christ. There was many disciples who turned away. 
Doesn't mean any of them were saved. Disciples just mean a learner. I can be a learner of Tim. I can be a disciple of him. But he can't save me. None of those, disi those disciples that turned away, you know why they turned away? Because they believed not. They believed that he was not the Son of God. But those who remained with him believed. They believed he was the Son of God. Amen. After they bounded Jesus, they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to uh, <clears throat> Cyphus, uh, which was the high priest that same year, which says in John 18, 13. Shortly afterwards, he was blindfolded in Luke 22, 64, 65. Listen to what it says. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And many other things blasphemy spake they against him. So they smote at him, put a blindfold over him, and says, you know, if you're the son of God, won't you, won't you prophesy? Prophesy who, which one of us smacked you? That's what they did. Not knowing that this is the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty, taking this from wicked, sinful men. That's love, folks. He turned the cheek. He turned the cheek for you and I. Amen. And for those who beat him. Because he loved them. He loved them. He was beaten and spit upon. Listen to what Matthew 26, 67 through 68 says. Then did they spit in his face and buffet him. And others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, Thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? And had they plucked off the hair of his beard. They plucked off his hair. That's when it says in Isaiah, Isaiah prophecies in Isaiah 50, verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. This was God, folks. This was the love of God coming down from heaven to be a sacrifice for men. And these men spit in his face. They plucked his beard. They beat him. They mocked him. They laughed upon, at him. But he loved them. And we did the same thing. We might not have been there to smack him or did all that. But us who were lost, we rejected him. We rejected him. But thank God he saved us. Thank God he died on the cross for our sins. Amen. <clears throat> After the beating, he was sent to Pontius Pilate, who questioned him, and then sent him to Herod after Pilate finding out he was a Galilean. But Herod with his men, they also mocked him too. It says in Luke 23, 11, it says, Arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. They arrayed him in a gorgeous robe. Treated him like, you want to be a king? Here, be a king, and laughed at him. But he loved them too. I tell you what, this is love, folks, because I don't know, there's no way, I mean, at the very beginning, I'd probably been out to start with. But this is only something the Son of God could do. A love that, I, I, that we can never understand is the love of God through Christ Jesus. Jesus was sent back to Pilate. The crowd spoke before Pilate. They cried out, warning Barabbas to be released and warning Jesus to be crucified. You know, the scriptures never say much about Barabbas after that, but I wonder... Did Barabbas ever get saved? What happened to old Barabbas? I mean, surely that shows forth right there when Barabbas left. That's another, that's another sermon in itself. Here was Jesus taking the spot of Barabbas, who was a murderer. He was set free and let go. Jesus stood before Jesus took the place of Barabbas. You know, who knows? Who knows what could have happened to Barabbas? Maybe we'll know one day when we get to heaven. We're with the Lord. Maybe, maybe we'll see Barabbas. Maybe we won't. <clears throat> they wanted him, Barabbas to be released. And they wanted Jesus to be crucified. Here's a man, Jesus Christ, who did no wrong. Like the beautiful scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says this. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we, may, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He knew no sin. And we can stand right before God because of Him. Not because of us. Not because of anything we could do. But simply because this man Christ Jesus died in our place. The perfect man. The God man. 
the Son of God. Before, before, lead, uh, before being led to the crucifixion site, Pilate ordered that Jesus be flogged. He ordered him to be flogged. What does flogged mean, if anyone doesn't know what it means? Flogging is the act of whipping or lashing someone or the act of methodically beating the human body with special implements such as whips, lashes, rods, or any other device that inflicts pain and harm. This was a horrific ordeal. Being flogged was a horrific ordeal. In fact, it was so bad that the Roman law would not allow Roman citizens to undergo it. That's how bad it was. Jesus was first, let me, let's explain what happened. Jesus was first stripped of all clothing, then tied to a post with his hands above his head. And the reason why they did that, to stretch the skin, making the wounds worse. You know, you stretch your skin so much, you know, it, you know they could really get the wounds more easily. <clears throat> Let me get back where I was. Uh, he was then flogged by one or two people with a whip. This whip, often called a cat o' nine tails, you've probably heard Pastor Tim say it a lot in a lot of his sermons, a cat o' nine tails, and it was consisted of a handle about 18 inches long, with line, it was uh, with nine leather straps about six or seven feet long. And at the end of each strap was small lead balls mixed with uh, pieces of animal bone or metal. <clears throat> These would tear into the body more and more with each successive lashing, with the lead balls ripping into the skin and the jagged pieces of bone or metal tearing it out. As the flogging progressed, muscles Vital organs and even the spine could often be seen openly. You know, even getting halfway through this, you know, I think about the little small sufferings that we go through in this life, the little pains that we go through, uh, the little things that we may say. It's nothing compared to being flogged. Nothing compared to what Jesus did. Hey, you know what? We're going to die one day. He purchased our salvation. We're going to be with Jesus Christ for all of eternity, saved, set free from sin because he did this. Because he went through that. He went through that. <clears throat> it says vital organs and even the spine could often be seen openly. Huge stripes of skin would be hanging from the body. The fact that Jesus was conscious and made it to the crucifixion is a miracle. And proves to me that only God himself could endure such suffering without dying. Because most victims of logging died before they ever got to the crucifixion. The Bible even tells us that he was unrecognizable. Probably didn't even look like a human being anymore. You could probably see, as, as I just read, you probably could see his spine. <clears throat> then after the flogging, Jesus was then clothed and led to the common hall where the soldiers stripped him again. Listen to what the scripture says in Matthew 27 through 31. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. They mocked him. They spit upon him. They drove those nails, that thorn, <clears throat> that crown thorn around him, drove that into his head. And he did that for you and I. He did that for us. That's how much the men that was doing that to him, they were pressing in, mocking him, pressing those thorns into him. And these thorns were about two inches long. And you can imagine just pressing that into him. This is after he got flogged. This is after he was beaten refusely. And there he is being mocked. And we can't even tell a soul about him. And I include myself in that statement. I'm no better than y'all. But he did it for us. He did it for us. What a great love. He did it for those men. 
Those thorns were about two inches long and extremely sharp. And we know since head wounds tend to bleed easily and profusely, we know Jesus had blood pouring down his face from these thorns. You know, the world mocks Jesus today just like these soldiers did, especially celebrities who one of them, I, I talked about this a while back, there was one celebrity, I'm not even going to say his name because it's just a prov provocative name, but <clears throat> he had a concert and he was coming out on a cross being crucified in his concert in front of all his people. And he was, he was on a cross mocking Jesus Christ being crucified. He was mocking them. And you think that Satan's not after your children in this generation and this music and all this crap you see on TV, but we break a blind eye to it all the time? My kids are being attacked. My kids are coming after. Satan's coming after my children. Every time the TV comes on, I'm waiting for something to pop up. Some homosexual act or some word that pops up or some nonsense, some blasphemous thing that are coming after my kids, that are coming after your kids. It's every day. But you know what? One day the mocking's going to stop. One day it's going to be over. One day my kids are going to be set free from all the trash that's around them. One day I ain't going to have to wake up thinking, is somebody going to come into my child's school and shoot them down? Because Jesus will come and put an end to all this suffering and put an end to all this stuff. They put homosexuality right in our faces. And tell you to accept it. The New World Order agenda is right in your faces. And they say accept it. Bow down they say. I'm not bowing down to their nonsense. I love my family. I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is not some game that we come into church. And we play get together. And we sit down and all play a game of Uno. This is serious. This is serious. I think about my children. I think about Morgan. I think about Aiden. I think about my family. I think about all of us now at this moment. We are in some bad times. I know everything is, nothing is new under the sun to God. I know we see, I mean, we see horrible wickedness in the Old Testament and in those times. I mean, some things beyond what we're seeing. But this is our generation that we live in. And, you know, and this, this little Nas character, this little Nas X character that gets on the screen and, and doing all kinds of wicked stuff with men and stuff. They are wanting to recruit your children. They don't, they, what they want to do, what Satan wants to do through these wicked men, it's all an agenda, it's Satan's agenda, that they want to get your kids and they want to take their minds and they want to shut you down. But we have to, as the Bible says, we have to stand fast. We have to stand fast. To be honest with you guys, I, 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 you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't. I don't know what's going to come. I'm, I, I'm Seriously, I believe the next thing that's going to come is, is persecution is going to come upon our land. It's calling for it here. They're calling for us Christians to disappear. They don't want us here. And you know what? This world isn't our own. We got a kingdom to come. But while we're here... We must preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the crucifixion of, at Calvary. All right, so we're going to go back. If you remember when we first read Luke, um, Luke 23, 33 through 43. So now we're going to go back. We've kind of worked our way up to the title was, is which thief for you? So the whole point is we kind of, we, we talked about Jesus being in the Garden of Gethsemane. We talked about, you know, how he was, uh, the, uh, how he's flogged, all the things he went through, and now we're working our way up to that crucifixion scene when he's actually on up at Calvary, Golgotha Hill. So, <clears throat> uh, verse 33, it says, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, 
There they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Jesus was in the middle and two men on each side of him were crucified along with Jesus. Also, let me remind you of Jesus when he was crucified. His arms were stretched wide enough to dislocate his shoulders. Okay? And we, and we see, what I, me personally, okay? What I see is, is when he's on that cross, I see whosoever will. His arms are stretched out. Why? There he is taking the wrath of God, taking the punishment for me, taking all my, all my wicked sins and all my blasphemies. All the sin of the whole world was placed on him. After he was br uh, brutally beat, spit upon, mocked, all the above, he comes with his arms stretched wide on Calvary. Amen. He comes with his arms stretched wide. And that's why I said, you know, when we read in Revelation, the last chapter, whosoever will, Jesus says, whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life. And he says, freely, because it's free. Praise God, his arms were open for us. Whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever will. It's those who preach false doctrine and false gospels that keep whosoever will to come. Jesus says, whosoever will, you can come. You come, no matter what you've done. You come, and he'll save you to the uttermost. The Bible tells us he saves to the uttermost. Verse 34, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots, only if they knew whom they were crucifying. Only if they knew who was on that cross dying for them. But this had to be done so that even those who stand before him and mock could be saved. Because he loves and desires them. The ones that were mocking them there at the crucifixion. Crucifixion. He loves and desires them to be saved if they will only believe on him one day. He was dying for his enemies. The Bible clearly tells us that all men are enemies of God before the individual is saved. Did you know that you and I were enemies of God? Before we were saved, we were the enemy of God. See, man says they're good by their own standard. But the Bible tells us that God has a standard. See, what we like to do is we like to measure ourselves on what we think is good. I like to measure myself, well, I'm, I'm better than this person, or I'm good, or I may even create my own moral system in my mind, or my own standard of what I think is good. But the Bible gives us a clear standard of what's good, and it's called perfection. With that, no sin. If you were going to get into heaven without Christ, you've got to be perfect. People have to realize that you're not good. You're not good. We say, like, oh, he's a good man. And that cringes me when we even use that term. Because the Bible says there's no one good but God. We were enemies of God. We were not good in his sight. Look what Romans 5.10 says. For if when we were what enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we were enemies. Even though we were enemies, but then when we put our faith in him, we were reconciled. Back to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we are saved by his life. Before we were saved, I was an enemy of God. You were an enemy of God. And what happened on that cross at Calvary is a revelation, I believe, of two things. One, it reveals our wickedness and shows us that because of our sins, because we violated God's law, his holy law, we deserve hellfire. We are deserving to be punished and <clears throat> handed over to the wrath of God. And that and that this is what it took so that we could be saved and have peace with God is that his son would die and take our place. And then I believe number two, it reveals the mercy and love of God that he has towards mankind. You'll never find this in any other religion, quote unquote, when I say religion. I don't look at, I don't look at this as a religion. I look at this as my reality now. Amen. I wasn't seeking religion before I got saved. Before I got saved, I wasn't seeking anything. You know what I was doing before, right before I got saved? Smoking dope. I wasn't seeking God. I was smoking dope. That's what I was doing. I was smoking some weed. <clears throat> I wasn't looking for him, but he found me. He found me. He was looking for me, and he saved me that day. Amen. And I, you know what I learned on that day when I got saved? I learned that God loved me. Amen. I saw and realized that I was a sinner. I realized how wicked I was. 
I didn't just see it because it was just words like, okay, realize you're a sinner. Okay, say this prayer. No, I saw that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. <clears throat> and then I saw the love of God. I saw it. I saw the love of God in my heart that He came down from heaven. This God who I've sinned against, who I've broken all His laws, who I deserve to be punished. And I've sinned against Him and Him only. But. Every time I sin, I sin against Him and Him only. But... As we see in the scriptures, Tim loves to say, but God. But we know, but God. I realize he came down from heaven. He came down from heaven. He decided that he would take on flesh. He decided that he was going to live a perfect life. He decided that he was going to bore the sins of all men. He was going to bore the iniquity of us all. He decided he was going to die. He decided he was going to be buried. He decided he was going to rise from the grave on the third day. And he decided that he would save anyone who believed and take them to heaven and take them to glory with him and that, we, that they would reign with him forever. Every other religious system can't find this. You know why? Because every other religious system is formed by Satan and every other religious system is formed around man and what man can do. But Christianity is formed around what God did. Verse 35, and the people stood beholding and the rulers also with him derided him saying, he saved others, let him save himself if he be Christ, the chosen of God. Then it says, and the soldiers also mocked him coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. So we see they continue to mock the Lord and challenging him to save himself if he claims to be the son of God. But what they didn't realize because of pride and the stubbornness within them is that all the proof had been around them the whole time. It was around them the whole time. The Son of God was hanging on a cross right before them. And this is what they say. If you're the Son of God, why don't you get yourself down from here? Surely, if you're the Son of, of God, you can get yourself off of a, a cross and save yourself. But only they knew that this Son of God was dying in their place. Who was reaching out to them. Saying, I love you. Here I am, I love you. I'm dying for you. I did this for you. This is my gift to you. That's why salvation can't be earned. It's not about what we do. God is calling out to man saying, I love you. I died for you. I want to save you. But you will not come. That's what he said over Jerusalem. I can't even, I remember that scripture just a little bit. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And I ain't going to go for the rest. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> they continue to mock him. Here is the son of God. The prophecies that Isaiah spoke of his crucifixion are being revealed before their own eyes but they continue to deny him. All the healings and wonderful things he done during his ministry and so much more they still ask him to show proof. But the time, uh, the time has come, as Jesus said in John 2, verse 19, he says this, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then two verses later, he says, but he, it says, but he spoke of the temple of his body. <clears throat> that time has come. That time has come. And a subs uh, superscription also, verse 38, superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, in Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. See, that was the accusation they charged him with, that he claimed to be the son of God and to be equal, one with God, and which gives the conclusion that not only is he the Messiah, but that he is God. Because they had no other accusation to give him. Because he didn't do anything. He, knew, he, he never sinned. So the accusation is, is he claims to be the Messiah, the Son of God. He claims to make himself one with God. Oh, but they didn't realize that God was in control of all this. God had the plan. And he endured. <clears throat> now let's look at the thief of the cross as we wrap it up here. The thief on the cross. Verse 39. 
And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, now picture this, you have the crucifixion, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen it probably on some Christian films and stuff, or maybe a picture, uh, but you have you know, Jesus in the middle, and you have one thief on the left and one thief on the right. Now picture this. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. This is a picture of judgment. This is a, this is a beautiful picture that we see on the crucifixion here. You got two men who are condemned. Two men who deserve to go to hell. Two men, no matter what they could do, they're condemned before God. Okay? <clears throat> I want to know, is this you? Are you, and those who are listening live stream, are you, are you the thief on the cross just like him, denying God in unbelief? Denying the Son of God? Are you the one saying, God, I'll, I'll only believe if you'll just do this or get me out of this one? You know, most people say that. Even unbelievers will say, God, I'll go to church Sunday if you just, if you just get me out of this mess I'm in. Or, or, or Lord, I, I, I'll do this or I'll do that. I, I, I'll trust you only if you'll do this for me. That's what the thief was saying. Pretty much. You know, get us down from here. If you're the Son of God, get us down from here. Look at us. God didn't owe that thief anything. God didn't owe that thief anything. He doesn't owe anybody anything. He was dying on the cross right there. If anything, we owe all to God. We owe all to Him. Even, even though owing all to Him or serving Him will never be good enough to save us, we save Him because we're saved. I mean, we serve Him because we're saved. But all glory be to God. <clears throat> Many unbelievers do that. They say, I'll, I'll believe in God. Uh, I'll believe it if God will do for me. I'll only believe in the Son of God if He'll do for me. He must show me proof. That's the mindset of this thief. If you can get me down here, then I'll believe. That sounds like the atheist, and, and uh, it sounds like the atheist, don't it? That's what it sounds like to me. Uh, I'll give you an atheist real quick. His name is Stephen Hawkins. I don't know if you know him. I mentioned before. He's an a worldwide known atheist. He's dead now, but he was in a wheel. It was like in a wheelchair, and uh, many atheists in the atheist community revered this man. They loved this man. They looked to him as uh, I don't even know the word for it, but they look at him as as whatever. But they look at him as everything. Uh, but him, no different. <clears throat> who no different than this. There who is denying Christ on the cross, Mr. Hawkins denied Christ and made this statement. This is what he, the statement he made. He said, I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when its components fail. He told the Guardian, uh, which I think this is like some kind of publication or something, there is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. And he died. And today he is in hell. Today Stephen Hawkins is in hell. You might say, well, well, God would, well, God would put someone in hell in a wheelchair and all that? Yes, he surely would. You know why? Because Stephen Hawkins was in his right mind and he knew that man, I believe, heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and he denied Christ just like the thief on the cross did and he's in hell with them today. And many today Stephen Hawkins are leading to hell with his books. But Stephen Hawkins could have been saved, and Stephen Hawkins could have been saved and not, and could have lived in eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ with a new, with a new body, never have to be bound to a wheelchair. But he chose his destiny. He rejected the Lord. Verse 40, and we'll wrap it up. But the others answering rebuked him, saying, and this is the other thief now. This is his response to what the thief, uh, the other thief said. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? So we see two men both condemned, and with Jesus in the middle, who was the only way of salvation. And then he continues to say, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. The thief on the cross repented and believed to be saved. That is, he had a change of mind of who this man was on the cross. He had a change of mind of who this man was on the cross. No longer did this thief look at this man as just a man on a cross, but I believe he believed that this man was the Son of God 
He believed that he was the son of God. He had a change of mind of who this man Jesus Christ is and he acknowledged his sinnership in the eyes of God, the Father, uh, the God the Father, and placed his faith in Jesus as the Christ. At that time, listen when he said, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Remember me. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Here's a man who has recognized that he's hopeless. Here he is on a cross. There's nothing he can do. There's nothing he can do to save himself. But he turns to Jesus. And he says, remember me. Remember me when, the, uh, me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He did the only thing he could do, and that was to believe that he was the Son of God. He trusted in Jesus at that moment to save him. And that alone was enough to save him. That alone was enough to save him, that he believed on the Son of God and trusted him. And we see in John 20, 31, it says, But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through believing, uh, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Amen. That's exactly what happened to the thief on the cross. <clears throat> he believed. On the name of the Son of God. Verse 43. And Jesus said unto him. Listen to Jesus' response. Jesus said unto him. Verily I say unto thee. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Amen. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Amen. Which thee for you? I'm asking. There is coming a day you will die, unbeliever. If you die unsaved, you will go to hell. Then you will be raised up to face God at the great white throne judgment. You'll be judged and you will give your account and found guilty and will be cast in the lake of fire because you was not washed in the blood of the Lamb. Don't think just because you come to church, you tithe, you do good deeds, feed the poor, or trusting in your works, devotion to reading the Bible, or professing to be a Christian. Listen, you can do all those things a Christian would do. Pray, read your Bible, go to church, sing in the choir, and even preach behind a pulpit. But those things will never be good enough. Those things will never be good enough to get you into heaven. No. If you're not born again and washed in the blood of the Lamb, then you won't go to heaven, period. The thief on the cross who was saved didn't have any time to be baptized, devoted, to turn from all his sins, like many say you must do to be saved in lordship salvation, that you must turn from all your sins, or some will say it to be baptized, or speaking of evidence of tongues. The thief on the cross had no hope. He had no hope, okay? There was what? There was, he had time to get down to get baptized. He didn't have time to reform his life, to get himself cleaned up. The only thing the hopeless man could do on the cross is turn to Christ and trust the man Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And when he trusted him, he said, Remember me. And the Lord said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And he's with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven today. What a testimony that is. What a testimony. What power that is. What power that is. The only thing the thief on the cross could do is believe on the Son of God, trusting in Him alone to save Him. And that alone was good enough to get Him into heaven. Last thing. This doesn't have to be you, unbeliever. Because God loves you so much. If you are alive and breathing today, be wise like the thief who trusted in Jesus. For Jesus died for you. He loves you so much and died to keep you from going to hell. I'm telling you, hell is real. Amen. This book is real. Right. When I got saved, this book came alive. It's not a joke. And God didn't take it as a joke because you were worth his time to come down and die for. So accept his free gift. Be like this thief on the cross who accepted the free gift of salvation by trusting in this man who is not just as the Bible, uh, just as the world says, a man who just lived. But this man is the Son of God. Right. This man is God manifested in the flesh. And God is reaching out to you. Don't wait. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. That means you. He so loved the world. He loved you and I. And that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus Christ, that whosoever, that's you and I, believeth in him, should not perish. That means die, go to hell. 
Because we know we're going to die in our fleshly body. But he's speaking spiritually. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. Salvation is a free gift. Receive him today. Because if you don't, you'll suffer the consequences of hell. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we just come to you in prayer, Lord. I just thank you so much for your time, Lord. I thank you so much, Lord, that your, your presence, Lord, is known, God. I just ask you, Lord, just to lay your hands on all of us, God. Help us and encourage us, Lord, to be more like you, Lord. In these times that we're living in, God, I just ask you to please just build us up, Lord. And, uh, Lord, just work in our hearts, Lord, as, as your children, Lord. Help us not to be disobedient children, Lord, of yours, but to be obedient to you, Lord, and, and to fulfill whatever calling you have. In Jesus' name, amen.